Without further ado, I want to introduce Manel Barria. Thank you so much, Candice and Jasmine, Maria, and everyone. I'm really flattered and humbled with the introduction. So it's a really pleasure spending this evening with every one of you on this platform. Uh, and I'm happy to contribute here. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. We're super excited. And before we get into the numbers and all the, the good questions, tell us a little bit about your story. You started your CPA firm with your sisters. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, so growing up, my father had two businesses and one of that was real estate. But, you know, he had uh, we had a lot of financial struggles with his business and which was totally devastating for the entire family. So I literally started my journey of CPA at the age of 17 with the drive to prevent others from facing similar financial hardships. Uh, unfortunately, when I got my degree in my hand and uh, you know my first job, I realized there are huge gaps between strategic tax advice and tax overpayment and what really business owners like my father are looking for. And that made me realize that the textbook knowledge is not enough to reduce any kind of tax payments. So I pursued for specialized training as certified tax strategist, a lot of uh, broad spectrum business advisory trainings. And that's when I realized that I could significantly impact businesses with smart tailored tax strategies. And um, that's when we launched uh, KB Tax Divisors with my sister who happens to be a CPA as well. Um, we are three sisters and all three of us are CPAs and we work together focusing on proactive strategies so that no other family suffers like ours did. I, that's so amazing. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love to hear your story and where you came from and how you've taken something and used it to help others, because that's kind of how we all got started. It's how we've used something in our in our personal stories to then not only help ourselves, but then go back and help even more people from it. So I'm glad you shared that because that's <laughs> so important. And can you tell us now how you and your firm use the knowledge of the IRS code to help your clients save on taxes. I mean, this is like the big excitement. So like, thank you for telling us about yourself, but like, how can we save on taxes? Absolutely. It's a very loaded question. I wish I know. a short answer on that, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I kind of often tell my clients, think of IRS tax codes as, you know, department store coupon booklets. It's very easy to understand. People can relate to it. You have the coupon booklet, um, and if you use it, you want the deal. You have the coupon booklet you forgot at home, inside your car, or maybe it's in your pocket. Store wins, right? So the IRS tax codes are similar to those coupon booklets. You know, there are legal tax breaks, deductions, credits. All of that is designed to help you save money, especially if you're a business owner, because IRS tax rules are more in favor of business owners versus ordinary wage earners, right? Uh, whether you call deductions, expenses, home office, vehicles, retirement plans, um, entity structuring, all of that, it's in favor of business owners versus wage earners. And that's where real estate definitely comes in place, not just for tax reduction, but increasing and building your net wealth because that's the stability we all need. <laughs> So I would say, you know, um, there are a lot of things that can be done and it just is painful for me to see when people leave money on the table, not knowing how to do it, what to do, and just fill out the forms, checking the boxes only for the submission to the IRS. That's not how, the, you know, the, the, there are so many people who are so proactive looking at the bank balance on their personal and business account but they're not diligent and reviewing their taxes that periodically. So like if I can give everyone number one advice today, I would say be religious. The, at least half the time you check your weight on a weighing scale 
check your taxes where you stand. Because if you measure where you are, you can do a lot of things before the year is over. So I think we spend a lot of time checking our rate, but we don't spend any time <laughs> checking on our taxes. So, um, you know, uh, that's kind of number one thing I highly recommend at least uh, every other month, if not maybe four times a year, check your tax liability where we stand um, and what can we do to either minimize or what can we do to budget to pay for it? And that drastically makes a huge difference. I love that because, and I have to ask this question. So sorry, I know I jumped in. Uh, so you say you're like a coupon book. So does that mean that you are going to help us use all of these coupons in the coupon book? Because I am the first person who buys the coupon book and forgets about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, I wish I can give you a short answer as yes. Uh, because okay. this coupon booklets are like, you know, prescription drugs. Right. Right. You cannot expect same result uh, as someone else, knowing mm -hmm. the fact that your hormones could be different, your body could be different. Right? right. So we have to look at the overall picture. And what I mean, you know, I come across so many people, they're like, I have heard on the internet, S corporation is good. And they end up buying properties inside the S corp because they have heard all good things about the S corp, but you should never buy a property inside the S corp. That's the worst thing you want to do. Yeah, I mean, if you want to buy a property, it goes under LLC, partnership, all the other entity structure, right? But you cannot buy a property under the S-Corp. In the similar way, you know, the tax strategies, whether you call deductions and credits and all of that, it's dependent whether you have other offsets that can eat one another up, right? Like people have heard about real estate, right? Um, it's great for tax strategy. Uh, again, real estate is passive income. It cannot offset your W-2 income so that you have to strategize in a way that you achieve the end result you want to achieve. Look, that's that's great. That's great. And that really actually leads to my question because I... Um, I know the difference between the passive and the active income because you and I have been working together now for quite some time. Um, but can you explain to uh, the ladies on the call who aren't as familiar with the differentials between passive and active income and passive and active losses? Because that's a big thing that comes up in our commercial real estate world. Yeah, it's very common. And, you know, uh, think of the active income where you are actively involved, uh, you are providing services. The example could be your wages or salaries from the job, self-employment income. It could be your commission, tips, bonuses, or income from actively managing a business. You are day-to-day -day involved in the operation of the business. Um, and active income can offset your active losses but active income cannot offset your passive income. And passive income is something you earn income with minimal efforts. Taking risk is not an effort counted for passive income. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So with the passive income, it's a little or no ongoing efforts. It could be either rental income, interest income, dividend income, um, income from limited partnership, income from investing in other investments, you know, uh, in a private equity and whatnot. It's the, or income from the business where you are not materially involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Um, so that's a huge main difference between the two. So in passive losses have some limitations. To eat up your passive losses, you need passive income. Passive losses cannot be offset against your W-2 or your income from your business. So you need, um, you know, some sort of passive income. Now, oftentimes people who are investing in real estate, um, they have passive losses because of the nature of the industry, right? That's the number one reason why people step in uh, real estate, you know, to kind of take advantage of passive losses. Um, and one of the things I would highly recommend instead of letting your passive losses being carried over year after year, you know, the moment you know you have a loss, try to find streams 
to create some passive income because that loss will be offset right away. And that passive income is going to be pretty much your tax-free cash flow. That's one option easier to do. Um, the other option, of course, converting that passive income to be an active income and calling it a real estate professional and whatnot, it's a little bit more complicated because if you're just starting out, reaching up to the real estate professional could be a little bit more complicated. So it's easier to come up with a passive income cash flow versus, you know, going on the real estate professional side. That's really good. And I was trying to explain to one of my investors where he has a W2 job career and she's a stay at home wife, but she's very heavy in, in real estate. And I was trying to explain them how, you know, he doesn't have to pay taxes because she is a full-time professional. Can you explain how does that work uh, for them? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's a classic example. And we have various clients who does this, you know, where one spouse is actively involved in the business, the other spouse, either taking care of kids or just managing real estate portfolio. Um, you know, for them, you have to be tracking your real estate professional activity hours. It's every year you have to be tracking. Uh, and that's 700 hours or more in a year. And if, uh, you know, and, and it can get complicated if you have multiple LLCs, uh, you know, uh, 500 hours for property and whatnot. But when one spouse is actively managing all the businesses, um, that whole real estate portfolio becomes active income. So this spouse's real estate passive losses, I mean, real estate losses can offset another spouse's W-2 income. So it's not like the exact same a person has to have those losses. Husband and wife, as long as they are filing joint tax return, one can be actively involved with the real estate. The other one could be a W-2 high net worth individual and it can eat up and offset one another's losses. That's good. Thank you so much. Uh, and then when can you give us some strategies when we're business owners and one of the things that can help you some money on taxes? Absolutely. So uh, definitely you all have heard about qualifying as a real estate professional. That's definitely there. Uh, if that one is a little bit challenging, as I said, try to find easy streams to create passive income. If you have financial advisor and you speak to them, hey, I need this much of passive income. They are really good at creating that passive income to offset your passive losses. That's one of the way. Um or Excellent. just investing in, sorry, I have to put the plug, <laughs> but just investing in one of our deals that gives passive cash flow uh, month, uh, quarterly. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, definitely investing in the deals that are giving you positive cash flows on, you know, as a passive income, that's definitely another option to think about um, the accelerated depreciation on the cost aggregation study. Um, you know, pretty much everyone uh, knows to an extent on that. Um, the only time you could go wrong on the cost seg is you have losses generated with the cost aggregation study, but then you don't have another stream of income created on your personal side. Now you did the cost seg. You went through that whole process that losses could be sitting. So it's very important, even before you consider the cost segregation study, you have the passive streams of income figured out. Um, that's number one. Um, and in your case, uh, you know, I was actually re reviewing the uh, slide that you shared earlier, where you have multiple deals and multiple streams of revenue that can be generated on there. So the moment you invest in uh, passive loss generating activity, within a few months, have the passive income generating activity ready to offset one another. You know, so before the end of the year, you have that good offset. Instead of paying taxes, investing will be will take you farther along because you can always borrow on that money. It goes against your net worth taxes are not going to be counted towards your net worth or credit history or whatever you call it, right? So plan in advance. Like if you know right now, if I don't make this investment, I'm tracking to make $100,000 in tax payment. I'd rather take that risk and invest and take the advantage of that offset. So that's uh, one of there. Um, 
operate in the right entity structure. Know what, which entity came in when you take home, how is it going to impact your personal taxes? The structure that is right for someone else may not be right for you. Um, and maximize on um, real uh, rental property expenses, um, as well as you know real estate credits like low housing income credits and things like that as well. Um, so th those are the things that I would highly recommend. Great. So now we're going to shift a little bit because I want you to provide some of the golden nuggets you have provided me as a professional. Um, so can you give us some examples and some uh, strategies that you give your clients um, when they're when they have IRAs and um, LLCs and S corporations with a partner, a spouse that may be a W-2. Yeah. So, you know, I think I would start number one, which is a low hanging fruit and requires minimal effort, right? If your spouse has a W-2, first take a look at their pay stub. Are they maximizing on their 401k? Most people with the high income they have this benefit in their mind. They think they are maximizing it. But 90% of the time when I look their pay stuff, they are not. And they don't even know that fact. So I would say, first of all, start with your spouse's um, employee benefit policy because those are low-hanging fruits. It requires minimal efforts on your end and the benefit are higher, right? So 401k maximization, HSA, it's... Um, you know, so many people have so many misconceptions on health savings account. Uh, and if you have the option to get an HSA and contribute to the HSA, I would go 10 times and contribute to the HSA over 401k. Um, and there are various reasons behind it. Um, in the health savings account, I think uh, this year's limit is uh, almost 7750 no, $8,300. Uh, money that you contribute to the HSA account are completely tax-free. HSA, you can tap on that account to pay for your co-payment, medical bill payments. If you have enough cash flow, do not touch your HSA account at all. The reason why you don't want to touch that, you can roll it over year after year, the HSA accounts, and if you withdraw that money, maybe three year, four year, or after the age of 65 for medical expenses, that is completely tax-free. So 401k, you get the tax deduction up front, but then you have to take required minimum distribution and pay taxes on it when you're living out of the low income and you don't have wages and whatnot, right? In future, with the HSA, you get the tax deduction now and in future, it's like pretty much you can convert it like your retirement account and use to pay for your medical expenses, your long-term uh, long care premium, all of that. And the beautiful thing is you can buy real estate properties inside the HSA as well. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and people are not aware of that. So you can buy uh, real estate properties under the HSA. You can do the multifamily unit investments under the HSA. Uh, once you have enough of uh, you know balance accumulated, and if there is a gain on those properties, that sits in your completely tax-free bucket. And that's another win. So in future... If, if and when you need money for medical expenses, you have created that self-sufficient bucket for yourself. So um, that's one of the things I highly, highly recommend. Um, other than that, you know, often overlooked um, what we call your own uh, housing, uh, what we call home office deduction, it's a smaller thing. Uh, you rather take the reimbursement, reduce your living expenses, right? And get the tax benefit for that. Uh, in home office tax deduction, you know, it, it, it's the detailed documentation you create, more better you are, you know, with all the tax strategy. So I, many accountants don't know or don't have time and bandwidth to create the detailed documentation. As a result, they only focus on tax return preparation 
and not guide clients on how to utilize a tax strategy. And that's where most people fail. Um, and here, what I'm talking about, if you kind of go reasonable and necessary in identifying your home office deduction, you can take a deduction for portion of your swimming pool expenses as well, as well as your loan care, your snow removal, your mortgage interest, property taxes, and all of that. Uh, many people are taking home office, but they are not going to this extent. And um, when you can take advantage of a lot of IRS legal loopholes, tax credits and deductions, um, I would say don't over abuse on any tax deduction because it's not worth it to mess with the IRS on that side. Yeah, that's great. That's that's awesome. Uh, what are some of the other tips that you can give? Because uh, we have quite a few solo entrepreneurs, business owners on the call, things that they can look at that their typical tax preparer is how I call it, um, will not necessarily give tips or advice on. 